Hello everyone. Hope you're doing well. We're going to begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 this morning. And yes, I forgot my glasses this morning when I left the house. We'll make it through. Hope everybody is healthy. When we come to chapter 11, it'd sure be nice to have the specific question. But we don't. And so we're left to try to study the text and come to some conclusions. As Paul begins this chapter, he says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. He doesn't say follow me as long as I follow Christ. He's saying follow me even as I follow Christ because when you follow me, you follow him. In other words, if you follow Paul, you won't go wrong. I wonder, could we say that? I might say to you, follow me as long as I follow Christ. Really? Well, with Paul, he's all the Corinthians had. They learned everything about God from him. Paul was the inspired man. Today, I would tell you, follow the inspired book. I would tell you, look to Scripture and follow Scripture. Or I might say, as long as I follow Scripture, follow me because when you follow me, you're following Scripture. So Paul is not on the ego trip here. Paul is the only way the Corinthians have come to know the Lord. And that's why he says, when you follow me, you won't go wrong. Why? Because as an apostle of Jesus Christ, I brought you the word, not with men's wisdom, not with cleverness of speech, but I brought you the wisdom of God. And that's when you, why when you follow me, you won't go wrong. And then he begins in verse 2 and verse 3. And it says, I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things. Keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. <laughs> traditions are not here things handed down. The traditions I delivered to you. The revelation of God, the wisdom of God, I delivered to you. So he's not talking about things from one generation to the next generation. He's talking about here's the word of God that I came and I delivered to you. And therefore, you remember what I delivered to you. But he says, I want you to know the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. So he's laying down this hierarchical order, if you will. And says the head of every man is Christ. Well, man was created by God. Woman was taken from man. In fact, the Hebrew is womb, W-O-M-B, hyphen, man, womb, man. Woman is taking womb, man, and putting them together and having woman because she was taken from man. And so because of the created order, man is the head of woman. He's not saying that, well, the woman doesn't have to submit to God and the man does. Or the woman has to submit to man and therefore doesn't have to submit to God. She's responsible to God as the man is. But what he's talking about is in this relationship, in this relationship, man has a head and woman has a head. And so down through verse 15, at least, verse 16, <clears throat> he's now going to talk about this relationship. He's going to talk about how woman is to bring glory to her head and how man is to bring glory and honor to his head. Some have said, well, what Paul is saying here is just a matter of custom. Well, what I would ask is, as we read something from verse 7, it says, for man is in man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he's the image and glory of God. When does man cease being in the image and glory of God? Is that custom? And then it says, but the woman is to the glory of man. When does woman cease being to the glory of man? Is that just custom? So what I would suggest is that what we have here are not things that just relate to custom. 
In fact, the custom of covering was not universal. It was not the, the, the Greeks did not do it the same way the Jews did. Uh, the Jews prayed with a little beanie on their head, but that wasn't the covering that's being spoken of here. It didn't cover any, it didn't cover their head. The Greeks prayed without anything. But Jewish men would be thought would not would not have thought a thing, would not have thought at all about praying to God without having that little beanie on their head. And so he's not talking about something that's just a matter of custom. I think something else is important is when he says here in verse 4, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. What is there in this text that has to do with an assembly? Is this just a covering that applies to when we come into an assembly that a woman is to cover her head and a man is to be uncovered? That is, using a veil? Praying is not peculiar to an assembly. Prophesying is not peculiar to an assembly. Paul's not talking about things here that have to do with spiritual gifts and the regulation of spiritual gifts. Paul's talking about things that have to do with subjectivity. That's why in verse 3 he said what he did. God Christ, Christ man, man woman, that's why he gave that order. He's talking about things that have to do with subjectivity, not spiritual gifts. He's not regulating spiritual gifts here. We get to that in verses tw chapters 12 through 14. He's talking about the role that each has and the subjectivity that is required by each one. Every man praying, that doesn't include spiritual gifts. Prophesying may include spiritual gifts. Prophesying was, was used to, to help man uh, foretell uh, the word of God. Prophesying was used to try to help man uh, teach the Word of God, uh, foretell the future, prophesy things in the future, for, uh, teach the Word of God. So that might have been spiritual gifts. Prophesying might have just, just been plain, plain ordinary teaching. So there's nothing in this text that suggests that what he's talking about here is something that is required for an assembly. There's no indication of an assembly in this text. So that destroys... Most idea about the hat or the veil in assembly. And by the way, a veil and a hat are not the same thing. Whatever significance a veil has uh, is not peculiar to what a hat has. A hat has. They're not the same thing. And so this he said, a woman is to cover her head, but a man is not to cover his head. I think a few things that have to be put in place here that help us understand this that they would have understood. Sometimes you have an argument in Scripture that is uh, ascending, the least to the greatest, or descending, least least to the greatest. Then you have ascending. Let's see, I think I said those backward. Descending. Descending is greater to the least, uh, and ascending is uh, least to the greatest. What you have here is an argument in descending order. He gives the greatest weightiest argument first and then we'll give the lesser argument last the greater argument is in verses 1 through 12 the second argument is in verse 14 and the third argument that he will give here is in verse 16 and so he's laid this down in verse 3 you have God Christ man and woman you have this chain of authority and it must be maintained and everything ought to be recognized with that. Whatever the problem this is, it's obvious it had something to do with the violation of that chain of authority. And it seems to center upon the woman. Though man is not isolated from this. There are different words that are used here in the scripture that I think are really, really important for us. The first word is the word kata, K-A-T-A. Kephales, K-A-P-H-A-L-E-S. It's a word that means covered or overwhelmed. It denotes an abundance of that which is being filled up or covered, fully covered. Uh, that, that, that is literally anything down over the head, the covering implied. The second word is A, 
Kata, K-A-T-A, Kalupto, K-A-L-U-P-T-O. Kata is the word for down, generally covering A is the negative. That is not down. So here's something not down, not fully covering. So you have one that is fully covering, one that is not fully covering. Now, whatever the covering is or not fully covered here is not supplied at this point. It's neutral. It hasn't been supplied yet. Then the third word is the word parabolian. P-E-R-I-B-O-L-A-I-P-R-I-B-O-L-A-I-O-N. And that's the word simply to, to throw around. Para is around. Bowen is throw, to throw around. And then the third word is the word kaluma, K-A-L-U-M-M-A. And that's the word for veil. Uh, a veil is a parabolian. But not all parabolians are a veil. You could have a robe, a mantle, a veil, a toe sack, any garment. But not all would be a veil. Veil is the specific word, kaluma. Just like we'd say tuxedo is a specific kind of clothing. Parabolian would be any kind of clothing. It could be overalls. It could be a dress. It could refer to any article of clothing. But kaluma is the word veil, and that word kaluma doesn't appear in the text of First Corinthians chapter 11. Yes, the American Standard translates the word veil, but it's in the verb form. And the verb and noun forms, even though from the same root word, don't mean the same thing. I may say the night was veiled. Did it have an article of clothing over it? A veil on it? No. A veil is an article of clothing, but the night was veiled simply says the night was covered. A verb needs to be preserved. Also, the word for veil is nowhere in the text. And so if he'd wanted the word for veil, Kaluma, he would have used the word for veil. The Holy Spirit could have used that. So notice what he says in verse 4. Every man praying or prophesying, have his head, having his head covered, dishonors his head. Why is a covering on his head a sign of dishonor? Because the covering... That which fully covers the head was a sign of submission. And it was a disgrace for the head of the home to wear a mark of submission. And then he says in verse 5, But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. And so here is the uncovered. Uh, again, whatever the covering is, we're not told here. It can be a paper sack, a toe sack, a bushel basket, it doesn't say. But the emphasis is on her head is not adequately covered. So these two verses show that when a man and a woman do not follow the instructions here, man dishonors his head, Christ, and woman dishonors her head, the man. And that makes to violate that something more than just a matter of custom. Then in verse 15, he will say, but if a woman has long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. That word for is instead of. Uh, here it says a veil. Uh, if the word veil is kaluma, that really strengthens the argument. Her hair is given her in the place of a veil. But here's the word for general covering. Her hair is given to her instead of something else to throw around. Her hair is given, given in place of that. So he's talking about something all the way through this. What he's talking about is hair. Look at what he will talk about. Look at what he will say in verse 5. We stop just short of this. For it's one of the same as if her head is shaved. And then he says, For a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. Shaved would be just like Michael Jordan or, or Yul Brenner or someone who who has no hair in their head or what little they have, they, they shave it off completely. Slick. Shorn would be, be a, like a crew cut. Like little boys get crew cuts uh, or like what we used to do with lambs. They would be cropped. And so you'd have a crew cut, something cut real close, but not quite down to the scalp. Then you have verse 15, but if a woman has long hair, then you have long hair. Then in verse 14, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, is it dishonored him? There is not long hair. So 
not long hair belongs to the state of man. So you have shaved or shorn, both went with shame. Uh, nobody, men or women, did this. It was a mark of shame. And generally was used of a harlot. It might be done in those extreme times of duress. The Jews were very expressive people. Uh, in some great sorrow, they would tear their clothes. They would put dirt on their head, their hair, their beards, to express utter contempt for anything shameful by their appearance. David's men were insulted by shaving their face. Uh, they wouldn't come home. Nehemiah plucked out the beard. And so those were signs of shame. And so what we begin with is we begin with the order of creation. And Paul will pick that up in verse 7. For man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is in the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. The normal state for man is not long hair, but for woman it's her glory. Uh, men didn't normally shave their head. Men didn't normally have their hair shorn. Shaved or shorn was not the normal state for anybody. Normal for woman was to have long hair. Normal for man was to have not long hair. So you have four states, shaved, shorn, not long, and long. And notice it starts out with hair and ends up with hair. Hair is the only thing specifically mentioned as a covering. And he puts it in distinction to a veil. So He's not simply talking about custom because custom was not universal, as I said a while ago. The Jew, as I said a moment ago, would not dare think about praying without a beanie. That would be the opposite. We'd never talk about a covering for men because there's no universal custom for men. So if it's making a custom argument, you would deal the same with the Jew as you would with the Greek. The Jew prayed with his head covered all the time, but the Greek had no covering. So, praying can't be established as miraculous. Prophesying probably was something miraculous, as I said a while ago, to predict the future, to use his teaching, to declare and celebrate praises of God. But if it's custom, then there's no dishonor to God. Then come to verse 6. He says, For woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. For shame, but, it, but if it's shameful for a woman, be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. In other words, her head is not covered. Let her be shorn. Let her just go ahead and be, be totally, uh, take it down. Let, let, it, let it just go ahead and shave it. Let it all be shorn. Uh, saying, let her make her shame complete by cropping her head or shaving her head. Uh, she dishonors her head when she rejects this place, the glory that God gave her. And so then he will say in verses 8 and 9, Woman is not from man, but man from woman. Nor was man created for woman, but woman for the man. So here you have man was alone, man was created for the woman. In other words, there's a compliment here. And what he's saying is, is that every man comes from woman. And so you have the interdependent relationship that is here. So she is to be his complement. She's not inferior in rank or nature. Her rank is indeed honorable, though subordinate. And it's sometimes more honorably subordinate. Yet man is to be the head, the position, that's the position or place of man. So in verse 10 he will say, For this reason woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels, to have her head covered symbolize subjection or physical, uh, visible superiority. If a man covers his head, he acknowledges dependency on some earthly head. A woman must have a sign of subjection to her head, and this is realized by her covering. You have the word in verse 10. It says authority, a symbol of power is there. Woman be set, woman, woman be set, uh, woman asserts her equality before God, not by insisting herself, but, but by recognizing her true position and fulfilling its claim. So it's the idea of permission, uh, not, not the idea of, of liberty. And so she's praying and prophesying. She's showing respect 
for the sign of respect of the prophet and for the word of the prophet that established a chain of authority by what by having her hair having her head fully covered and so then we come down to verses 11 and 12 nevertheless neither is man independent of woman for woman is independent nor is woman independent of man in the Lord for woman came from man even so man also came through woman but all things are from God that's essentially what he says back in verses 8 and 9 while man has headship uh, while woman is of man by creation not only that uh, man came through woman so it shows the inner relationship what is necessary for the well-being and happiness of the other the woman is not an invaluable part of God's plan men and women possess different roles but equal value in God's eyes so that's the first argument that's the way to your argument here's the command of God don't dishonor your head by having your hair not long, shaved or shorn, not fully covering the head. And man does not have his hair, does not have his head covered. That is long. Now we come to verses 13 through 15. Judge among yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head covered, head uncovered? Doesn't even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Now, what does nature teach? You know, little boys learn pretty quick on the playground. They don't play with dolls. Oh, they may go home in the quietness of their home with their, with their sister. Uh, they may play with their sister to have that socialization with one another. But little boys learn. Little boys don't have long hair. Little boys don't, don't play with dolls. Why? What does nature teach you? Nature teaches you that it's a shame. Long hair is not something boys wear. That's something that is indicative of girl. So does not even nature society in which we live? Now, I realize societies are different and societies change. But whatever we have in our society, he says, here's something that society teaches us. If we in our society go with the unisex thing where boys and girls look alike, that's custom, all have hair cut alike and wear the same clothes, then eventually diverse roles begin to take place and they decide to look different but come back with a boy's hair down to his waist and girl having her hair crew cut. And yes, that's something of what we see today in society has changed. And so in some sense that's changed. But verse 7 is not. The glory of God and the glory of man. And then he says in verse 16, but if a, anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. The no such custom is the no such custom about being contentious about this. Uh, his argument is that if any contention exists, where did you get such an idea of contention that woman would pray to God uncovered and violate her role of a woman? Not from God, not from the apostles, not from God's wisdom. So he says, we don't have any contention custom about being contentious not with having custom about having long hair or not long hair we've not written this so you can be contentious about this but let's come to some practical things to think about as we begin to look at this chapter and close it out someone will ask the question how long is long and that's a good question long is relative isn't it it's relative in time but 30 minutes can be short or long if I have my hand on the hot stove, that's too long. If I just started two-week vacation, it's a short time. Say, well, a woman ought to have long hair, and that means she never cuts her hair. Does long hair mean never cut, and if cut, she cut her glory? Say she has hair three feet long, but cuts off half an inch at the end. She doesn't have long hair anymore? So because that's the only way we can be sure it can be long? Long means long as long as you can grow it, someone says. Well, what about man? Does it short mean as short as you can cut? Then everybody will be shaved. Or does it simply mean not long? If it's not long, what we've said was when the woman who trimmed her hair every month and has three feet left, it wasn't long. What about man who has hair down to his waist, but he cuts off an inch at the bottom every month, but he still has three feet left? 
but it's not too long. Uh, it could be, but never gets longer because he trims it off. Does he still have long hair? Well, everybody realizes that. So it doesn't have anything to do with never cut. Uh, long is in respect to man. Man, A woman's hair, long hair. And while the argument has to do with her relationship to man, the practical side or reality is this. We don't know how long long is. But we really don't have a problem about that, understanding that. We even have law in short in respect to man. Man does wear his hair long or short. Understand, we have a burr or a comb back. I'm not saying like that of a woman when she wears her hair long or short. They're entirely different. Entirely different than a man having long or short. Men, men may have long way, uh, may have hair long way down her back. Or short, but not short like a man's. So the relative terms. The point about this is, a woman shows her submission to her husband when a woman looks like a woman. But when a woman looks like a man, wants to work like a man, and wants the role of man, and wants the appearance of a man. The problem here seems to be the appearance of manliness among women, and therefore usurping her, her role of man. When we start with a movement that's going to erase the differences between men and women, a unisex movement. It wasn't long before unisex looks began to take place. Unisex looked because of unisex ideas. Women were going to be the same. The same work, same talk, act the same, look the same. Everything is going to be the same between men and women. And pretty soon, they look the same way. But we can't disregard the role. We need to get the attitude right and accept the chain. There's no problem with long or short. Women ought to look like women, and men ought to look like men. The sin is not only in cutting her hair to fail to satisfy, fully covering the head, not hanging down, not fully covered, not clearly distinguished in a woman, but in her attitude toward her head, and ultimately God. She rebels, her, she rebels against her God-assigned role. Her hair is a God-decreed mark of her role. Man re rebels against his role when he looks like a woman. Mom will never want to look or act like a woman. And the woman will never want to look and act like a man. Women ought to look like women, and men ought to look like men. And so we have. Women are to be in submission to men. A covering of long hair is to be a token of submission. A woman must have that token of submission. It's not a matter of fashion or personal style. But our style and our personality ought to, ought to correspond to our sexual identity and not obscure it. We should be willing to adapt our style to honor the glory of God. And so he gives this instruction relative to how a man is to honor his head and a woman her head. So as I close, let me ask you something. If Paul has spent first 10 chapters arguing that the elements of the Lord's Supper were the bread and the fruit of the vine would now look pretty foolish to come down then and conclude the elements of the Lord's Supper were something other than the bread and the fruit of the vine just so if Paul has spent 10 verses telling us the element of the covering is the hair. Doesn't it look pretty foolish to conclude that the element of the covering is something different than the hair? Think about this. And thanks for joining me. Look forward next time to beginning chapter 12 and continue our study. Again, have a good day.